Good morning, Zaya. How are you? Good morning. Great to be with you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join this series of sentientist conversations. It's a real privilege to add you to the guest list. I've admired your work for a long while, so it's great to have oh, the chance to have a proper conversation. Thank you. The feeling's very mutual, and I know I'm in very good company. I've seen you've had some terrific guests, so uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great. Great. Well, so as you know already, this is a series of conversations about what I think of as the deepest and most important philosophical questions. And they're ones that people tend to, I think, get wrong and then skip on by to other topics. So I like drawing people back to these big questions. And they're the questions of what's real? Uh, how should we best understand reality and the universe we share? But just as importantly, what and who matters ethically? And I have an obvious bias because I'm trying to popularize and develop this really simple pluralistic worldview way of thinking called sentientism, which suggests the answer should be, let's use evidence, reason, and then have compassion for all sentient beings. So it takes quite a naturalistic approach to the what's real question, and I use evidence from reality to try and understand it with humility. And on the ethical question, it's essentially saying that every being that can suffer, every sentient being should matter to us, at least as a sort of baseline moral position. But I'm talking to people in these conversations, as you know, who you know disagree or agree with that start. So it'd be fascinating to understand your own personal philosophical journey and where you've got to now. But before we get on to those big questions, how would you best introduce yourself and your work to people who don't know you already? Sure. Um, well, I have to say, I have listened to some of your previous podcasts, which are wonderful, and I'm looking forward to it because I think we end up at the same place, but I think we all get there with different paths. Uh, and it's been remarkable to see that. So um, I am Zaya, and I am a science broadcaster presenter, uh, as you would say, in the UK. And I'm also an author. So I wrote a book called The Reality Bubble. So I'm going to have a lot of fun chatting about reality. And the book, in essence, is about 10 of humanity's biggest blind spots. And it takes a scientific lens to sort of expose those views that we wouldn't normally see and we can't really perceive with our normal five senses. I also serve on a couple of, well, I serve on a whole bunch of boards, but a couple of them are related to animals more specifically. So I serve on the International Board of WWF and also on uh, We Animals. Uh, and I, I don't know, have you come across the work of We Animals yet? Yeah. Okay, terrific. Has Joe been on here yet? Because Joe yet. should be on this podcast. I'd love to take su guest suggestions. I'll put Joe well, on the uh, list. Yeah. yeah. So just to give your listeners a, a sense of, of what they do, uh, Joanne MacArthur founded We Animals, and it's a terrific organization, a global network of animal photojournalists who travel around the world and photograph what's actually happening to animals behind the scenes, whether it's in factory farms, whether it's in bear, bear bile farms, whether it's zoos, what have you, really giving a voice to the voiceless. And I suppose one last thing is uh, I tweet a lot of earthlings on Twitter, but maybe we could talk about that a little later. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. Well, let's get on to the first of these two crazily big philosophical questions. And as you said, you've written a book about this. So I was really keen to talk to you about this. Um, but on this what's real question, for many of my guests, it's a story about whether they grew up originally in quite a naturalistic, scientifically minded family and social context, for example, or one that was maybe a bit more mystical or supernatural or religious, and how that side of their thinking about how to understand reality has changed over their life, if it has. So you can wind the clock back as far as you like to tell the story of your epistemology, I guess, where you've got to now. Wow. Okay. I don't know how much of my early youth shaped my ideas of reality. I think being a biracial person uh, gives you a sort of split view, right? So, I mean, part of me is Chinese, part of me is Eastern European, very, very different worldviews to start. Even concepts like time, for example, in the Chinese worldview, really long cyclical perspectives. And so, you know, your perception of reality just with that start uh, having both a communist background, a capitalist background, you know, growing up in a, in a Western country as I grew up, uh, gives you many different frames of reference for reality, right? So I, I never really, I think, took one true dogmatic reality to be. And I've also found that as I've grown up, I consistently shed layers of what I've previously thought of as reality um, and as various truths. And to be honest, I've come to realize 
as I was getting ready to talk to you today, that since writing the reality bubble, I have a different perspective of reality already, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think it's something, you know, one of the opening quotes that I was going to start with that I never included uh, in the book is by Yoda, which is you must unlearn what you have learned. And so much of the process of, of thinking about reality is fundamentally shedding the dogmatic ideas of reality that we are fed through society, right? So uh, that's, I think, one perspective. Mm. Another is, of course, you know, my career now as a science journalist, science presenter. So I've uh, had a perhaps naturalistic background in one sense, but I've listened to your other podcasts. And here's where I think, you know, when we get into the super nature, I also have very different perspectives that lend themselves as well. So I think that with science, you can reveal a lot. Uh, the whole book is about that. In fact, it's about how, you know, we can see black holes, we can see, you know, the little demodex mites that live on my eyelashes with science, but we can't see it otherwise. But science also has a very objective view of the world. It always puts a lens between you and the subject. Yeah. And the humanities, of course, open up Oh, they're much more subjective as well, aren't they? Right. So I'm also a big fan of polymaths, having both those backgrounds, being, you know, having somebody with a background in the humanity humanities as well as the sciences. And I think really that blend uh is what's interesting to me. When I find people who are sitting just with one lens, I kind of feel like that's a blind spot in itself. Yeah, that's really interesting. So there's a there's there's that appreciation for science and the scientific approach, but there's also that appreciation for the more subjective humanities flavored, you know, personal perspective that comes through too. Yeah. Well, I would say that, and I would also say that you know, um, increasingly, I have learned that indigenous perspectives, as I've gotten older, have so much to share with us about how we perceive reality. And, uh, you know, there are ways in which um, I wrote an article uh, for Canadian Geographic not too long ago, which was looking at uh, the preservation and the protection and conservation of wolf populations, sea wolves. And uh, I'm from B.C. And I'll tell you, I didn't know we had swimming wolves, wolves that could swim for kilometers. Right. So they were new to science. But indigenous peoples had known about these wolves for their entire history. Right. The other thing, though, is that they perceive the, the wolves as family, which, you know, as we're starting to understand the web of life better, we're actually understanding that this is actually a more connected and integrated yeah. view of, of other species. And so scientists today, uh, progressive ones anyway, are starting to work with what's known as the consilience model, which is a model which incorporates the scientific view plus an indigenous point of view as well. So it's called two-eyed seeing. And really by bringing together these two lenses, not only have they come up with far more remarkable st studies and, and research, including DNA research, which has come to the fore by bringing these two models together, but it's holistic and it's empathetic. And furthering that, of course, there's also plant medicine as well, which also, you know, Amazonian plant medicines like ayahuasca, which open up an entirely new door to reality and, and really confronts us with this Western scientific model of, of what reality is all about. So yeah. I, am, I don't believe reality stands on firm ground. And I'm very happy to run around <laughs> the ice flow as it as it shifts and moves. So, um, yeah, reality should never be solid. Anybody who believes reality is a thing, I think that's the only that's the only time we can think it's inaccurate. That's fascinating. Thank you. And I like the way you describe that, because there is this sense of science as being quite a narrow, formalized almost restrictive way of seeing the world. So some people will say, look, science is the only way of understanding the world. That's that's the only source of valid evidence and reasoning. But I think of, you know, in the evidence and reason of sentientism, I think of evidence and reason in a much richer, broader sense than that. You know, this mug, I'm pretty sure, exists and is in front of me, but I haven't done a double blind, randomized controlled test on it. And it's really just a subjective perspective that leads to me having some credence that exists. So I think there's all sorts of different types of evidence and reasoning. Um, I think our own subjective experience is a form of evidence. We can be skeptical of it, of course, as we should of all evidence, but our subjective experience is evidence too. Um, and as you've said there, you know, indigenous perspectives and traditional perspectives. Again, there's this weird sense in which some people will say, look, Western science is about evidence and reason. 
and indigenous and traditional perspectives are completely fabricated. And it's like, which what? I completely disagree with. I completely. Uh, yeah. It's genuinely yeah. bizarre. Um, yeah, because I mean, because, they're both based on observation, but different yeah. ways of knowing, right? And you've got indigenous knowledge that's been observing things, as I said, for millennia, which is why, you know, wolf knowledge is a much more complete canon that we have at sci as scientists. But again, even when you say something like, do I know this mug is here? Well, to me, this mug look like looks like it's here. To an amoeba, this mug would appear completely differently. And then to a neutrino, the mug wouldn't be here at all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The mug, it would just... Whew, Travel right through it's just the mug. A, a set so, of quarks that it ignores as it travels yeah, through the mirror. Exactly. Mid. So as we come to move forward in science, we we have to question our our everyday common sense notions of reality. So even though this looks solid, it looks real to you and me, uh, to different perspectives, it's it's simply uh it can vanish, vanish yeah. in thin air. Yeah, yeah, agree. And I think that doubt and that humility and that openness to new sources of evidence, even unfamiliar ones, is, is the real center of a naturalistic way of thinking. You know, there is this danger that a scientific way of thinking can almost become its own dogma. And you can see that with many you know, public scientific intellectuals who almost seem to be locked in their own form of dogma. And they seem to struggle with different perspectives and struggle with new evidence. But I think that humility and that error correction has to be at the heart of it. So, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. The humility is key. And and, you know, the the desire to change built into the model of science is the understanding that new science can build upon it. Uh, mm. But yet one of the most shocking things, you know, again, going back to indigenous knowledge and having the empathy and the wherewithal to know that you are connected to other living beings. But with science, only now, only now in this century, do we have scientists coming together saying, oh, yes, we believe in, you know, octopus being sentient or other, you know, other beings. Be it's taken such a long time yeah, yeah. and there still isn't consensus, you know, so it's a it's kind of a real laggard, actually, in some ways when you think about it. And there's a lot of dogma, right? Uh, yeah. I, I wrote about it in in the book, in fact. For the longest period of time, we we really looked at as, you know, looked at animals as if they were machines. And so, you know, I, I can't remember, I can't remember who I cite in there, but this idea of a dog howling when it's being beaten or what have you, is just like some sort of automatic response. Uh, when of course we now know that that's simply not the case. Yeah. Yeah. Scientists are not immune to dogma by any means. So mm -hmm. one, one of the central questions in this sort of naturalism, supernaturalism approach is, is the one of religion. And did, did you grow up in a religious context or was that something else that yeah, you had different perspectives from different cultures as you were growing up? Um, I, uh, it's funny, I just thanked my mom uh, over the Christmas holidays, because while we are Roman Catholic, my mom's the most open minded Roman Catholic you could ever imagine. So when I decided to dabble in whether it's been Buddhism or Sufism or, or what have you, uh, my mom, like myself, she's a big believer that uh, as as Sufi said, in fact, as Rumi said, sorry, you know, there's a 100 ways to kiss the ground, right? So there's so many ways of knowing that she's never been really restrictive. Um, and so this, again, this Eastern Western blend of knowing has been a part of my upbringing. Um, but in terms of sentient, sentientism, uh, one of the first real experiences that I had with it, um, which was a wake up call, which was through practice, uh, was when I did Vipassana meditation when I was 21 for the first time. And so Vipassana is a process, I don't know if you've heard of it or not, it's a 10 days silent retreat. It's a, it's a form of meditation where you are really guided by yourself, right? In, in many ways, uh, it's called insight meditation. And when you sign up to do this, it's, it's almost like you have, to, you have to agree to the 10 Buddhist precepts, which is a lot like the 10 commandments, right? Like thou shalt not lie, you can't kill, you can't do, and I'm like, check. Like, what are the chances that I'm going to kill or lie or commit adultery, do whatever. I'm on a 10 day retreat. I'm 21 years old. This is never going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as I'm walking along, so I can't talk to anybody, but twice a day you get to go for a walk. And so I would go for a walk and I had come across these ants that I would see every single day. And because I had absolutely nothing to do except for be inside my own brain, I would sometimes sneak a little bit of bread and come and feed them. And uh, one of the days during this 10 day meditation, when I was there, I, I was wearing my mom's velour pants that she had loaned me. Don't know why, but nobody was going to see me. So I guess I was wearing velour. <laughs> and 
And one of the ants that I was feeding got its head stuck in the pants, right? And, you know, because they're kind of, the fabric is kind of like that. And my first instinct was just to flick the ant away. Uh, but I would have decapitated the ant because its head was buried in there and its body was gone. And that's when I realized, oh my God, I promise not to kill anything. I promise not to kill anything on this trip, which I thought was going to be super easy. So I go over to the woman. I can't speak to her. I point at my pants. We cut out, a, we cut out my mom's pants at the bottom and we leave the ant there. And, you know, she said to me eventually, I think she could speak actually that, you know, if the ant found its way in, the ant could hopefully find its own way out. But I didn't have to go through the process of murdering a little being. Yeah. And since that day, I I have a really, I can't really kill things. Uh, so I can't really, you know, and I have a real respect for, for little beings. And so, you know, I don't kill mosquitoes. People don't understand how I don't do it, but I kind of, I use my legs sometimes as bait and I will put a cup on it really quickly and slide a, slide yeah. something under there. But, you know, small creatures have as much of a right to live as big creatures. And so, you know, that was a way of knowing that had nothing to do with science that kind of opened a door uh, to me or how to, how to, I don't know, how to really reflect on what the meaning of the sanctity of life was really about. Yeah. And some people like to separate these two subjects, you know, this classic is ought distinction, but I, I, I don't see that as a particularly valuable way of thinking. I think it's overplayed because as you said, sometimes just reflecting on the nature of reality links directly through to ethical implications, you know, where else could they come from? That's a really nice idea. And we'll come on to the ethical question next. But just to wrap up the, the what's real story, um, you talked about dabbling in a variety of different worldviews, religious and not, and appreciating indigenous perspectives as well. As you look back on all of that now, how do you think about the possibility of this supernatural now? Would you say that you you believe in a God or spirits or the potential for there to be things beyond the natural world? Or how do you think about that stuff where well, you are now? Yes, I, as I said, uh, after coming from a deeply, deeply ingrained, you know, very, very scientific, fact-driven mm. um, background, which I adhere to because I love facts and I love peer-reviewed science as much as the next person yeah. does. And I think it's a really wonderful way of accruing evidence. But again, my view of scientists, the best scientists are reality testers. They're always probing the invisible world and coming back with what they're what always looks like magic in many senses. Yeah. But at the same time, um, my understanding of plant medicine has now grown. And uh, that simply opens up another door to a reality that one is able to perceive firsthand. Yeah. that uh, has its own observational qualities that are simply not, um, there is no available science that does not objectify um, the that reality. It, it's absolutely immersive, but it's just as real. It's absolutely just as real. Um, yeah. So I, I, I certainly do think that uh, my supernatural worldview has blown open in a really wonderful and more enriching way um, that again, just like all like the buildup that I've been going through has been complementing, you know, perhaps like a little lotus flower, <laughs> um, uh, different views of reality. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't simply, I mean, I'll subscribe to science for what I need. You know, if, if we're talking about, you know, the Bernoulli principle and flying a plane, I'm, I'm going with that for yeah. sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, um, there are, there are a hundred ways to kiss the ground. There are other yeah. ways and Got other it. views and, and being in the 21st century, uh, we are nascent, nascent beings as well in our evolution. We're a very young species compared to many other species. Uh, and we have tremendous hubris, right? Oh, yes. uh, we were talking about humility, but we have tremendous hubris. And so uh, I'm very, humility for me is understanding that there are other ways of knowing and that we're just simply this technologically marvelous world that we live in now is wonderful, but it's here. It's baby. Yeah. It's baby knowledge. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And and the people I've spoken to who've had deep experience with 
plant-based medicines or psychedelics or meditation it's it's interesting i'll oversimplify here but some and i probably would go down this route myself will see those experiences as demonstrations of the mind-bending plasticity of the human mind and the rate potential range of sentient experiences that go way beyond you know maybe what we originally evolved to do as a baseline so they they go through those experiences they find the mind-bending but they still remain you know quite firmly naturalistic whereas other people will go through those experiences and and feel that they've got a different appreciation for what reality is it's not something that has just i've changed my understanding of my mind it's changed Mm -hmm. their appreciation for reality as a whole and it sounds like you're much more in that second camp where the experiences you've had there have, have changed not just the way you think but the way you understand reality itself is that fair I think that's fair. I think also that, you know, one of the common experiences that people have is of um, understanding the nature of reality and the connectedness of all beings. Many people, uh, I I hope, and again, who knows how much humility, humility I haven't even been saying this, but I hope that I went into my own experiences already with that knowledge. So I, I wasn't, I haven't really been, you know, I've been thinking of other species and creatures um, as being part of my world family for a long period of time. But for some people, that's really new. You know what I mean? They can't see how they're connected to a slug or anything like that. So plant medicine wakes up that knowledge for a lot of people. Um, At the same time, though, just recently, I... uh, And and I mentioned this on on, uh, another podcast, my friend Jan Arden's podcast, is I checked out the tree of life. I was just looking at it again. And I was just like, what the F is this? This is incredible. Uh, I don't even find the mammals. I mean, it's all these threads. It's like this beautiful, almost like confetti, like, you know, beast, (laughs) beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, image. So I I definitely recommend people Google what the tree of life looks like. And of course, and it's a brilliant way of realizing that we're not at the pinnacle of some pyramid of Absolutely oh. not. Absolutely not. There are so many different kingdoms for crying out loud than what you and I even grew up with in school. Mm. Um, so it's it's wonderful. And and I think that once we can place ourselves there and see a little bit differently, you know, start to see where human beings fit in amongst not only the 8.3 million animal species, but, you know, the fungi, the plants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then it becomes a much more wondrous world. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on to the, the second big question of what matters and then also who matters. Um, and sometimes the questions you know, merge together, but so you can answer them how you like. But how has that way of understanding the world as you've developed it led through into your ethics? What do you think good and bad, right and wrong? What do these things even mean to you? Is there some sort of core to the way you think about ethics and morality? Well, my previous life, before I started um, mm. on this path, uh, way back when, my my original PhD, master's and PhD, was going to be in forensic psychology. Oh, wow. uh, with yeah. a, I was I was working in a neuroscience lab, a, a lab that did a lot of neuroscience. Actually, it was uh, Dr. Robert Hare's lab uh, in Vancouver and Dr. John Ewell's lab, and uh, two of the world's foremost forensic psychologists uh, who were doing pioneering work. Uh, And the question, of course, was uh, they were working, Dr. Robert Hare is the world's leading expert in psychopaths. So the question was evil. And so a lot of my sort of thinking uh, scientifically and morally and ethically about what's good and bad, kind of I was I was very curious, right? I was always very interested in the fact that as a species, and many other species, we we can see uh, a spectrum of empathy and of lack of empathy. And so uh, it's interesting because we certainly see that in our species, uh, about oh, yeah. one in a hundred of us completely lack it, <laughs> you know, and and we all lack empathy or have empathy to varying degrees. And I think that that actually does play a part in our relationship to other beings. Um, there are people who, you know, especially as we know, serial killers, one of the marks of a serial killer is animal cruelty in the very beginning, right? You you can tell with, uh, there's that incredible documentary on Netflix called Don't Fuck With Cats. 
Have you seen that? I haven't seen it. Yeah. Oh, I haven't been able to bring myself to watch it yet. <laughs> it's, a, it's an incredible documentary because it's how a, a ragtag group of online animal rights activists track down a serial killer. And they're able to track him down because they're paying attention to who's who's being cruel to animals. Um, so, so yeah, if that gives you a sense of some of my uh, my background in terms of formulating academically, um, you know, moral moral scope. Yeah. So that implies so that focus on empathy implies one, I guess the ability to understand the perspectives of others and their interests and their needs and how they feel. Um, there's also an implication that we should we should care about that in some sense as well, which I guess takes you from empathy to compassion, the, the motivation to act with that in mind. And to my mind, that is almost tautologically the sort of central definition of morality. It's about whether and how to care about others and, in a sense, you know, try to value their lives and their experiences in the same way as they do we can never do that perfectly but but that seems to be a quite sort of s- simple core to ethics that i think many people would agree with i think there's also another frame that we can look at and that is when what happens when you're a truly transactional being many yeah. of us in the capitalist world live in a very transactional way and we only value you know nature trees uh you know there's there's a lot of people who only value them by the the dollar signs that they provide mm. but we have to also recognize then even if we're to think in that limited manner that the earth's engineers the planetary engineers as i write in my book are are bacteria you know what i mean algae black bacteria they're the ones that are doing all that hard work all the fertile soil thank you bacteria all the oxygen we breathe the majority of it, thank you, cyanobacteria. So it's really the the tiny, tiny critters, the invisible critters, who are um, really running the show. You know what I mean? We're kind of pompously walking around like yeah. we're yeah. Homo sapiens. We've been, but no, Masters you know, of if the they're universe. gone, we are toast. If the food chain is gone, we are toast. We are so absolutely reliant on this web of life. But again, that has nothing to do with empathy. You don't have to have an ounce of empathy to understand that. Um, and so maybe that's just more of the robot brain that can appreciate, okay, we yeah. are a part of the system simply because we are interconnected to it um, through the chain of existence and life itself. And we could not exist here without these other beings. So I think that there are different ways of knowing, yeah. again, how to approach that. And I think the... Um... I think you and I share this sort of sense of empathy and compassion for others being central. And that sort of seems obvious to me, but there are people who disagree, right? So there are, there are forms of egoism where people are focused on, you know, really caring about yourself. Ultimately, there are, um, you know, nihilists who will say nothing matters. And some people get there from a scientific perspective, you know, if we're all just quarks or, you know, quantum wave functions, then nothing really matters. And if there's going to be death to the universe, nothing really matters. And Okay, fine. You can decide that if you like. Then there's a relativist approach where people will say, well, you know, individual groups will somewhat arbitrarily come up with their own standards. And that's what determines what right and wrong are, regardless of the suffering caused. Um, And there's, you mentioned the transactional approach too, whereas it's about reciprocity and give and take and cooperation. And and in a way, I, I reject all of those alternatives because I think that even without any of those different considerations, the suffering of another being should still be morally salient to me. Even if I have no relationship, there's no transactions, there's no enlightened self-interest. But it is interesting because I think even for people who take a transactional approach or even maybe an egoistic approach, there are still so many ways you can draw them back to where, you know, I think we want them to be. Because as you say, if you point out, okay, fine, you have a transactional approach, but if you understand the rich nature of interdependency that everything has, you end up, you know, ultimately having to care about many more things than you might think and and even if you take an egoistic approach you know if you have an enlightened self-interest that recognizes those interdependencies again you can draw people back towards a more compassionate approach even if they think they have a different basis for their ethics but i think yeah like that's the the brain and heart uh sort of pseudo divide right because you know you can have a nihilist who loves dogs you can even have a psychopath I don't know that they would love dogs, but let's just say, right? But I, 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 it brings up the question, though, of at what point do we shut down 
the heart. Yeah. And as you very well know, there's the issue of carnism, how we separate species out into the animals that we love, like dogs and cats and birds. And then, but certain birds, no chickens, no pigs, no cows, no. Yeah. And somehow we have managed to throw and lavish all this empathy and love and connection with a few small species of animals, whereas everything else can, you know, get murdered, really, right? Yeah. We've got hundreds yeah. of, you know, we've got billions of animals every year, terrestrial and ocean animals that we're killing that are wild, plus all the farmed animals that we're killing. We are the biggest killers on earth. So, you know, we are operating in a in a highly psychopathic manner, yeah. despite nihilism, empathy, religion, all these other things that we kind of tell ourselves about our morality ultimately the big picture of how we're systemically destroying the planet um requires us to really turn a huge blind eye to to what we think yeah and and in a way I, that's a deep source of frustration i think to you and me because we see the inconsistency and the incoherence and the damage done of that selective approach on, on the other hand there is some hope there because it does show that nearly all humans are already able to extend compassion beyond our species, even if they're breathtakingly selective about it. So there's there's a sort of grain of hope there as well. But I'm interested in how you went through that journey. And that's the second part of this question, this who matters question. Because I think many people would listen to what we said about empathy and compassion and ca caring about others. And they're sort of, well, of course, until you bring up the question of non-human animals and particularly farmed animals too. So what was that journey like for you of, you know, extending your compassion and your empathy to non-human animals and well, I definitely, you know, I've been, uh, yeah, I was a David Attenborough nerd very, very much at the start. I was very lucky to meet Jane Goodall, who was one of those people who actually, you know, very famously says she had a dog and that opened up her mind, right? Yeah. And as a science journalist and working on Daily Planet for a decade, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, you know, to, to ha just have wonderful, wonderful experiences, including, you know, one of one of the most incredible was swimming with 50,000 beluga whales uh, in, in the Arctic one time. Wow. Right. But an incredible experience that I can tell you about more if you want to hear about it. But the other thing, though, is like I've really just I love beings. And so you probably know on Twitter because we're friends on Twitter is uh, I post as Earthling. So I'm just always finding all these different, it's sort of a hobby for me. And I, you know, because there's so much, you know, doom scrolling on Twitter, I just like to put up yeah. an incredible uh, new species or species that, you know, many people have never seen before. Amazing and, images. Uh, it's just tremendous because people are often so baffled and, and also it brings them so much joy. I just get so much, so many texts from people who are so happy to see the diversity of life. Of course, if I tweeted biodiversity every time, nobody would pay any attention to what I said. But I think it's this common, common literal ground, Earth, that we are Earthlings and that that we are all the same, um, that I hope people find inspiring. But at the same time, what I find troubling is that, you know, again, you know, whether it's work with we animals or otherwise. If I ever post about the plight of animals, if I ever post about what's happening behind the scenes, there's this automatic um, cringe effect. People hate it. People will yeah. people absolutely turn away. I wrote about in the book and talked about the notion of disgustology. People get disgusted. They don't want to see blood. They don't want to see murder. They don't want to see guts. Um, and so people... People will literally turn a blind eye to that. And so that's one of the scariest things is, is the horror. Uh, at the same time, we animals, again, I'm sorry, I'm basically doing a podcast for, for Joe here, is that she has such beautiful images um, that, that you are intrigued by them and that they, they pull you in. But for me, one of the very first experiences I had when uh, the second time that I stopped eating meat, um, the first time was I hadn't seen anything directly, I read my sister's book report and I was, you know, she had written a book report and I read her book report. So it was this weird secondhand sort of uh, knowledge. But I, instead, I, I came across a tweet one time. This is quite a few years back now. And it was on live export, live animal export. Mm. And 
the image struck me because I had never seen an image like that before. And it was an image of a cow with blood, tears, bloody tears. And I was like, what, what is this? I just wanted to click because I didn't understand what it was. And it looked real. It wasn't Photoshopped. And I came to learn the practice of stabbing cows in the eyes and also um, slicing their tendons so that they're immobilized during transport, which horrified me, obviously. And then I went right down deep into the very bottom of the well and, and watched a lot of horror, 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 horror. Um, and it had nothing to do with all these beautiful images that we're talking about. So there's there's two sides of the internet. A lot of people say that the internet, people love cats, right? It's the domain of cats. Everybody's posting cats and dogs. We love dogs. But the minute you try to show people what's really happening to animals, what's really happening to the rest of life, uh, that is that is one of the greatest sadnesses I have. And so my hope in posting about earthlings is, again, to to bring people in through enchantment, through wonder, to remind them that there are so many other species on the planet besides us that are just as valuable, just as worthy um, of, of, of making this place home. And I think the challenge and, and, and the art, I think this is the art of a lot of Joe's work and some of the images you share as well, is it, I think it's relatively easy in this day and age, given people's concern for the environment, biodiversity and you know everything that's going on, and this innate fascination we have for animals to bring people up to the stage where there's this fascination, there's an intellectual curiosity, there's an aesthetic appreciation. There might even be a recognition of, oh, that we need biodiversity because it might give us a useful medicine or it might help us with sustainability in some way. None of that has anything to do with the recognition of the individual in the picture. And, and I think that's where some of your images and Joe's work really help cross that boundary from you know isn't that pretty to what what must it be like to be that cow and that's the chasm i think that you know most of the human species has has yet to cross and i think you're right there's there's some disgust stuff there you know I, but there's also a disgust at our own complicity so there's a it's it's not just seeing the viscera and the gore and that type of disgust it's also a sense of a fear and a horror at our, at our own complicity. It's something we think is normal and we don't want to change. And you know, there's been so much brilliant work done on uh, cognitive dissonance and the crazier and motivated reasoning and the power of social norm that stop us seeing that. But I think that's the real challenge is getting people across that boundary to recognizing the individual. And um, that's you know, a well-documented problem in human psychology generally. And you meet someone on the street, they're... You know, busy people with their own lives and their own priorities and they're shaped by their social norms and we all do this and i think it can be sobering to remind ourselves of the people we were before we gave up animal products for example you know we weren't bad people we weren't evil we weren't psychopaths we were just you know ordinary people subject to social pressures and the things we learned but i have a specific frustration and maybe a higher expectation of certain groups of people and those include for example you know Envir committed environmentalists um mm. you know I, I do expect them to have this imperative to really see through to not just the energy imperative of climate change and environmental destruction but also the problems of animal agriculture ethically and environmentally so i have this big frustration with the environmental movement that it seems to pretend to have this super expansive concern for the the earth as gaia but still mostly conveniently excludes moral consideration for farmed and fished animals at scale, uh, despite I the ethical imperative. More. I, I really find that a, 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 a serious logical inconsistency. Yeah. And yet, I suppose the only thing I understand is, as, as you mentioned, right, when you're imbued in a world that brings you comfort, in a very uncomfortable world, some people cling to what they need to cling to. So, you know, despite the fact that you'll have climate activists looking at people who drive their pickup trucks, you know, and, and will defend their right to have their pickup trucks because, you know, it's part of the way they live their lives. Yeah. Uh, I see it's the same culture. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's our culture. It's our history. It's our family. It's how, you know, it's all those things. So quite often um, you're, you're dealing with, you're contending with, um, you know, dismantling a tight knit culture, a way family comes together. 
um, and you, you're sort of dismantling family and you're simultaneously asking them not to do things. So I have had a, a different perspective on activism for some time, which is, you know, definitely I want to twist things around and I, I like to present activism as a gift uh, rather than as something that's being taken away. And um, I've spoken about this a little bit. I don't know if it's okay if I, if I mention it just yeah, as, yeah. A, as a side note. But when I think about climate, one of the things that I've thought about um, is the fact that, you know, I grew up in Hong Kong, as I mentioned, and in Hong Kong, uh, we had 7-Eleven when I was growing up, but 7-Eleven stood for from open from 7 to 11, right? It wasn't a 24-hour uh, company, let alone did we live in a 24-hour society. And only recently did we start living in this 24-hour world. Um, at the same time, I'm bridging this other story together, which is what had happened in the 1990s in LA and in Los Angeles, they'd had a big blackout. And um, all these people in LA started calling the Griffiths Observatory, uh, which is that uh, the astronomy observatory on the top of Sunset Boulevard and calling the police because they, they suddenly saw a big orb in the sky and they didn't know what it was. And what it was, of course, was the Milky Way, but they'd never seen it in the City of Lights growing up. So what would it mean then if we were able to turn off the lights at night? What would it mean then if we moved away from a 24-hour society to just a 12-hour society the way we used to live? Imagine the energy we could save, but also imagine the life forms we could save. Think of the birds that would be able to migrate again. Think of the insects that would be able to migrate that wouldn't be suffering from all the light pollution. We would have sleep again and we would be saving energy. So I think that we need to start presenting activism as a gift. And, uh, you know, in terms of even how do we solution our way forward, you know, one of the gifts of technology that we've seen, of course, lately is cellular agriculture, which is starting to come to the fore, which is wonderful. And um, I'm sure many of your, your listeners, viewers will know what that is, but the ability to grow meat from cells from the cells of animals, but without harming the animal itself. And, you know, you still have the flavor then, you still have the culture, you can still bring families together. You don't have any of the issues that you would with waste, with water, with climate change, with forests, you know, and Land with use, animal yeah. cruelty. So it's it's really a win, 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 win. So when we start positioning the world uh, as how we can benefit from it, perhaps, because we are a bit of a selfish species. We are a bit of a transactional species. We are, we're always like, what's in it for me? Yeah. And I, I think the taking stuff away from people approach doesn't work very well. I mean, we know it doesn't work very well. So how do we present things as gifts? And I think that we may be a little bit more successful if we begin to do that. Yeah, I like that. And we'll come back to that when we talk about how to make a better future. But I love the idea of yeah, activism as a gift. Yeah. So so one of the groups that I find frustrating because they have this blind spot, as you've written about, is the environmentalists and getting them to see the non-human animal issues and getting them to take animal agriculture as a serious environmental issue in its own right, even independent of the ethics. That's, that's one frustration that we've, I think we share. The, the other group I have a frustration with, and again, because I have a higher expectation of this group maybe, is people who are scientific, have a naturalistic worldview. They might be atheists or free thinkers or skeptics or humanists who, in a way, many of them grew up maybe with a supernatural or religious worldview. And, and what they will say about themselves is that they were constrained by social norms into believing things that aren't really true and sometimes into some harmful ethics. But what they've managed to do is they've followed evidence and reason to find a more compassionate, you know, accurate way of living and you can feel that sort of pride sometimes in those groups because they feel they've escaped something and they've moved to a more enlightened worldview but those groups also seem to have this massive blind spot when it comes to non-human animals too um and that so that's another group that i find particularly frustrating and there's a long list of examples but you, you know you've worked with someone who's on the list for me, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, and again, it's someone who's, you know, you look at their intellect, you look at their insight, you look at their compassion, you look at their humanity, and you think, you know, this these people are potentially role models for the world in the way they think mm. about understanding reality and in extending compassion. 
but they only go to humans, right? They still seem to be trapped by these really powerful social norms. So again, I, I'm just ranting really, but that's another group that I find really frustrating. You know, people with a really rich scientific mind view, mind uh, set and a compassionate mindset that still are trapped by these social norms. I don't know if you've got any particular observations that, think, about why those people can't see either, or so many of them can't. I think the the thing is, especially when you have science presenters, uh, you know, and I, I can't speak to Neil's view because I simply don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I won't go into you, that now, but it's not, partition... it's not it's not the most impressive ethical oh, really? thing you've yeah, come I, across. I, I don't I don't know what it is, but feel free to share. Um, I think my my perspective, though, because I, I have met other science uh, scientists, science presenters who are a little bit like that. Mm. I think the issue is really that it's okay suddenly when you have like, you know, the octopus teacher or you have like a, you know, you have the elephant whisperer or you have the giraffe, you know, we have all these various specialists, the the person who, you know, runs with lions or what have you. And that person will come on the show and you'll be like, oh, I, you know, I defer to you. I defer to your knowledge. And that person will act as the compassionate portal to that species. Yeah. But aside from, you know, again, this is why David Attenborough is great, despite the fact that it took him a long time to get on the climate change tip, right? Which was a frustration for many people as well. Uh, but still, truly, one of the greatest of all time is because he was able to show us a holistic worldview yeah. and and bring up bring so many of these different species and show how they related to us, how they had families, how they would mate, how they would breed, how they would fight, like all these different sorts of things and the wonders of that world. So. Uh, whereas, um, again, don't know what Neil's thinking, but you know he's a he's an astrophysicist, right? So it's just not even like his head. Yeah, I think is yeah. in the stars. Like it's not even yeah. on our planet. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. But I I do I do echo your your frustration that seemingly you know biologists you would think that biologists would be with it. But that harks back to our very first um, point of discussion, which is yeah. that this notion of science as holding up an objective lens between you and the rest of the world, I'm going to examine you as a specimen, I'm going to give you a number, you're not allowed to have a name, you know, all those different things separate you from your object of study. And that object of study is, ceases to be a being. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, but at the same time, you know, even in the legal profession now, we're seeing those rights of nature ordinances. We're starting to see people understand that rivers, ecosystems, mountains have personhood. They all have personhood before a chimpanzee does, which is kind of striking, right? Yeah. That a river is a person, but a chimpanzee is not a person. So, yeah. you know, what kind of logic are we running with there? It's bizarre, isn't it? And I, th I think it does tie back to what we said earlier on, you know, scientists aren't immune from dogma. And people who are very proud that they've broken from some powerful social norms are often trapped by others. And I think, you know, again, to your reality bubble book and the, and the, and the problem of blind spots, I think this community love pointing out other people with blind, blind spots, as do we all, right? But it's really hard to remember that we probably still have some of our own and maintain that humanity around our own view. And I think, you know, the non-human animal agriculture ethics topic is like kryptonite to those people. You know, it's the one thing that you know, they'll point yeah. out other people's blind spots, but their own is is glaring and obvious to us. But uh, yeah. And have so, you had George Monbiot on the show? Because I mean, he's somebody who's certainly aware of the, yeah. the big shift and the need. I, yeah. I'd love to talk to him. And again, he's I think he's been on that journey himself as well, because he started out from a deep environmental drive, then and gradually and slowly yeah. recognized the you know the environmental impact of animal agriculture, and now I think is engaging more deeply in the actual ethics of. Yeah, uh, the animal topic and starting to see them as you know individuals in their own rights as well. So that, I, that's a fascinating story. I'd love to hear it from him. So he's he's, he's definitely on my wish list. So, and he's got a new book out. So yeah, absolutely. All yeah, it could, yeah. It could be could be good timing. Yeah, because he's absolutely trying to break that taboo. You know, if you if you listen to podcasts and read articles about the environmental crisis, you would you would think that energy was a hundred percent of the problem. Everyone yeah. loves talking about electrification and yeah, exactly. Um, but he's really, and... I think he's sounded the clarion call quite loudly. He's hitting uh, it hard now. He's yeah, breaking building that upon a lot yeah. of a lot of other people's work as well. So yeah, exactly. It's encouraging. I think things are starting to shift, but we'll come back yes. to that in a minute. So before I wrap up on this 
who matters question. I think we'd share this compassion for animals. Do you think this idea of sentience, is, is that a useful concept to you, this capacity to suffer as a, as a concept? Or do you tend to think about animals as the primary way you set your moral scope or I, something else? I don't know if I have the wrong definition for sentience, but I don't measure it by suffering. I measure it by consciousness. Mm. So I'm when I'm thinking about sentience, I'm just thinking about awareness, existence, uh, awareness, but not even necessarily like mirror test awareness. I don't think that, you yeah. know, you know, of the famous mirror test uh, for some of your listeners, this idea that you can go up to a mirror and if you put, let's say, a bit of chalk on a chimpanzee's nose or a dolphin's nose or various other species, they'll try to rub it off because they recognize themselves in the mirror. I don't think that that is necessarily the measure of awareness of existence or sentience. You know, we know that bees are playing, you know, insects are dreaming. There is just such a wide, um, you know, animals. And I write about the whole third and fourth chapter. I think the whole third chapter of my book is about all the all the ways that animals kick our asses. You know what yeah. I mean? They're yeah. just so much, they're profoundly better at, at doing so many things than we are. And so, um, yeah, so sentience as a definition, I just think needs to, I, 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 again, I don't know if, if, if it does have, is the crux suffering or no? I think it's, that's probably the easiest way into it because um, and just as an aside, the episode I just released is with Laurie Marino, who was one of the scientists that did the bottlenose dolphin oh, great. Uh, great. recognition test um, before she moved away from doing research on captive animals at all, but as, a, as an aside. But the way I think of sentience and consciousness, some people do think of them as basically being equivalent. But the reason I focus on sentience is because it is really that basic level of some sort of any sort of awareness, mm -hmm. uh, whereas other people will load in lots of extra requirements into consciousness um, then we have the same we have the same uh yeah, yeah. understanding so i, so of I tend to think of sentences is. as like the the a subset of consciousness like the most basic thing so if there's any consciousness it is sentience but things like self-recognition or the advanced ability to plan for the future or a certain advanced cognitive capability i'm like that those are all interesting parts of consciousness but they're not morally salient to me the morally salient thing is is that being aware you know, can things go well or badly for it? Does it care about things? Can it suffer? Can it flourish? It's that basic level. I That's the way I tend to use the term. I would, I, in thinking about it, I would frame it in terms of value, yeah. right? Um, because we don't value life on earth. One of the, one of the things that I wrote about too, is meeting Tim Cockrell, who's a wonderful entomologist from the UK. He'd be great to speak with as well. He's trying to revive the flea circus. And we went out for a drink. We went to the pub and he talked to me about how a lot of people, you know, sometimes a, a little fly or a midge will fly into your beer and you'll just pick it out like it's a piece of soot and just mm. flick it away. But it's it. actual life. Right. And and they, he and his friends have actually discovered new species that way. A, a You know, a little creature, I think a little a little wasp committed suicide in his cup of tea one day. And then he realized it was a new species. But the reason I bring this up. And again, related to why this Earthlings project on Twitter started is because we actually would lose our minds if we found a fly on Mars, right? If we found the tiniest, dinkiest little insect of a creature, if we found life on another planet, holy shit, all the news would stop. We would all be focused on it. This thing would be captured. It would be studied. It would be marveled at, and it would have incredible value. Although we have billions upon billions of species here on Earth that are just as diverse, wild, strange, ordinary, uh, simple, complex that we simply do not pay much attention to at all. Imagine if yeah. it was an amoeba. We would still lose our minds. <laughs> Nobody cares about an amoeba here. Nobody cares about a flea here on Earth. We just crush them. And in fact, we have a huge industry of pesticides and insecticides that are meant to annihilate huge swaths of our, our the base, you know, you call it the base of our food chain or many, many, many different earthlings, you know? So I think that, it is the value. We need to value one life, as you had said as well. Like, what is the yeah. value of one life? Um, once, once it becomes millions or trillions, once it becomes a statistic, um, nobody cares.
Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. And it's and it's at least aspiring to value that individual's life and experience in the same way they do. And and in a way, that's that's another way of thinking about sentences. You know, any any being that values its own existence, its own experience is is sentient, right? And I think that ability to value anything at all, you can understand why it evolved. One of my previous guests, Mark Solms, wrote an amazing book called The Hidden Spring that talks about how that feel that, you know, there's good things, there's bad things, I'm going to go towards the good and away from the bad, it really maybe, you know, 450 million years ago was probably the evolutionary root of very basic sentience, you know, that that caring, that valuing of things is sort of important to the survival of well, Absolutely. You know, and I think the, other, the other thing too, to c- keep in mind is, you know, we have something that's also known as plant blindness. You know, our, the oldest, some of the oldest living systems, that's what plant medicine actually relies on, is the fact that the plants know what's going on too, you know? In a sense, that's one yeah. of the newer awareness that I that we have is that these are living beings. You know, I have a big problem with Christmas trees now because I'm just like, there's a dead thing or a dying thing in the corner of the room that is alive, you know, has its own way of communicating, as we know from Suzanne Samard's science of being able to communicate with this, you know, mycorrhizal network with other trees, etc. But I, I came across something that I saved uh, just related to what we were just talking about. I thought I'd read it to you. Have you heard of Crypto Naturalist, the Crypto Naturalist on Twitter? No. no. He writes some just interesting poetry. His name is Jared Anderson. And I just like this little quote. This isn't a poem, but if I could share it with you, because I think it's quite true. He writes, an ant crosses your carpet. A spider weaves a pattern older than mammals beneath your stairs. Just nod, breathe, and think, good, it's all still here. The forest, the mountains, the desert, at home in my home. The sterile white box is the stranger, not the ant, not the spider. Yeah, I, right. love it. So, I mean, really remembering that we have encased ourselves and entombed ourselves in a whole other world that has separated us from where everybody else lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so until we can see the stars, until we can be again, uh, and again, this is where indigenous knowledge plays a huge part, right? Really connected to the world, connected to the land, um, connected to the spirit of it all, that, yeah. that we can begin to see a little bit more clearly. And I think one one of the things I find fascinating in linking sort of epistemology and the ethics is that if if you're from one of the more established, formalized religious worldviews that sees humans as something that were you know, magically created independent of the rest of reality, and that in a sense the whole point of the universe is about us as humans, it's much easier intellectually and emotionally to think of us as radically separate from the rest of the world. I think you both maybe some of those indigenous ways of thinking or more spiritually oriented ways of religious thinking that aren't so centered on a deity and have ideas of a himpser and connectedness built into them. But also, I think, as an enlightened scientific worldview that understands evolution, that understands small gradations, that understands there aren't chasms of difference. Um, and understands just in a physics sense how ultimately everything is connected. I think all of those different ways of thinking make it much easier to have that type of richer appreciation that we're not radically different from the rest of the universe we share. And and uh, I, I, there's no, I should have asked a question there, really, but yeah, no, it no, not me that- at all. I, I just yeah, I agree very much with you. I I just think that you know, with religion. You have, you know, as as you mentioned, sure, the Old Testament, you've got, you know, man dominating nature. I think that that is a worldview that uh, has unfortunately, and that one little piece of it, too, has has yeah. eclipsed so much uh, other stuff. But, you know, as you mentioned, Jainism, Ahimsa, you know, the 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 idea of, of nonviolent harm to all species, that's been around for like a long period of time. Buddhism yeah. completely Ancient on ideas. board. You know, the, you know, people are saying to me things like, oh, how are we going to eat? where are we going to get our protein from, which everybody says, it's like, well, Buddhist monks have been doing it for thousands of years. You know, what I mean? this is yeah. completely not new stuff. And so where we cannot really learn empathy from science, I think we can learn empathy from more of the spiritual traditions, which is why I'm not really into papooing uh, them uh, yeah. as, as much as I think my younger self would have. Yeah. Um, that being one of the one of the books that I read when I was 20 was um, by Houston Smith, which was the world religions, which really looked at 
you know, holistically, what is everybody saying and what is the central message? And that's that's actually a very beautiful book. I haven't gone back to it for some time, but I would like to because it wasn't focused as much on all the dogma. And yeah. as we've said throughout this podcast, the dogma is where we get in a lot of trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Spiritual oh, yeah. dogma, yeah. scientific dogma, you know, personal dogma. There are work. so many sorts. There are so many yeah. sorts. And I, th I think you can get to it from a completely naturalistic scientific worldview as well, because I guess my, my own stance is a sort of more boring straight down the line naturalistic way of thinking that doesn't really see any space for the supernatural or spirits or anything mystical. You know, I'm open-minded, but until I see evidence, I think it's vanishing un unlikely these things are part of the reality. But I do feel very comfortable with this broad naturalistic way of understanding the world based Jamie, on evidence. Jamie, you got to go do ayahuasca and then we'll have a chat. I know, I know. Every, people, people tell <laughs> me, right? we'll have a whole different conversation. People, people tell me, just you wait and your eyes will be open to you know, new dimensions <laughs> well, of reality. No, I think it's just more like, you know, until until you see evidence, right? So it's yeah. a question of like, until you see it, but that's your subjective. Yeah. When you when you see it, then then perhaps that'll be something very, very different. Maybe. And, I, and, and my, my hypothesis is that, I would just be really boring and I would say that's given you amazing evidence of the plasticity of my own mind and the range of sentient experience. Very possibly, very possibly. Or, or maybe I would be, <laughs> you know, I would I would have to be rewriting the website. But as and, an evidence you know, secret, no, I would never, I actually would never recommend anybody do it. Uh, yeah. It's not recreational. So simply you could never, it would be so highly inadvisable to do it as a test that yeah. I actually, I retract that statement. Yeah. Yeah. I retract. <laughs> Thank you. We'll put a safety warning on it. <laughs> But, but I think, no, it's an important point, right? Because the, a number of people have said exactly that to me of like, until you've done it, you you just cannot conceive of what I have seen and what I've come to believe. So, and maybe that's right, right? I, I need to be open-minded about it too. Let, yeah. me, let me finish this section about who matters with a bit of a sci-fi question that you may have delved into elsewhere. Do you think non-animals could be sentient? Do you think artificial intelligences ultimately could be sentient? Or do you think there's something about biology that means only biological entities can experience things and be conscious it's so funny because like just yesterday just browsing i came across a man i think his name is paul spira i i'm not sure i think that's what his name is and he was talking about uh, he was answering a question about whether or not rocks can be conscious and of course in my book i i talk about you know how certain people you know like japanese buddhists have a a, a real belief in you know needles having consciousness and stones having consciousness and even robot dogs having consciousness. And he was explaining it. Uh, and I would only direct the reader or listener or viewer to, to go and take a look at what he said, because I thought he actually had a really good physics sort of, he's not a physicist, I don't think, but he, he really broke it down to the elemental, again, uh, experience of existence. Yeah. To be sci-fi, to be uh, a rock uh, or this microphone that's right in front of me, it is sharing a common existence in space. It is miraculated. It is manifested. It, it is in existence with us. And so when you start stripping down questions as he does, which is too long for this podcast for me, he starts stripping down questions of, of what remains elemental um, with, the, with the microphone versus another living being, right? I mean, aside from the notion of entropy, which we can all sort of agree with, uh, yeah. and, you know, with living systems, you're constantly bringing in, you know, life, matter, oxygen, what have you to sort of stay alive before you kind of dissolve into that mist. But but he had an interesting answer, which I think philosophically approached the notion of objects even, um, perhaps not having what's known as sentience, but having um, a common existence, uh, a unified common existence with all things that share a common existence today. What yeah. you want to drill that down to, you want to drill that down to source, you want to drill that down to God, you want to drill that to, down to whatever definition you want to is is up to you. But I thought that that was really interesting. Yeah. So so thanks for asking that question, because I didn't think I would have an answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. I'll look, I'll look up that perspective. And then and, and I do find myself drawn in a couple of different ways. And, and sentientism is neutral on this topic, you know, what sentience is it just says whatever it is it matters right um but on the one hand um i do think it's most likely that sentience evolved as a capacity in simple animals in the cambrian as uh an adaptive evolutionary capability um and because i'm a boring 
you know, naturalistic person. I think ultimately our experience, our consciousness, our sentience just is what it feels like to run this class of information processing in the neural nets in our heads. I don't think there's anything more magical than that. So that takes me down a path that um, suggests that, you know, the vast majority of animals are sentient. Plants can respond and communicate in quite rich ways, but they don't have the capacity to actually experience things themselves as individuals. I think they still matter, but I think it's unlikely they experience anything. And the same with rocks and anything else. But at the same time, I can imagine if it is just information pressure, that we could artificially create, you know, something that could actually be a sentient robot or a sentient artificial intelligence at the Have same time. Have you been playing with chat GPT? Since yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, of course, right? Which is fascinating. Uh, you know, th thank goodness the one thing it seemingly lacks in this first or third iteration, as it may be, is, is creativity. It doesn't have that general spark for creativity, but it is an, an absolutely miraculous pattern recognizer, uh, compiler of information and data. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, we, we can strip everything down to code if we want to, right? DNA is code. Every single being uh, that is living, that part of this life force um, has code in it. So, you yeah. know, we could just be code, which is yeah. uh, one way of looking at it. But I, I think that there is, there is so much more. And you know, one of my friends who's a professor um, actually got me a book. I don't I don't mean to hark back to this ayahuasca notion, but I will simply because it's a book written by um, an anthropologist. And gosh, what is it called? I have I have it right on my bookshelf in the back. But uh, the reason I bring this up and mention to you about this notion of plant medicine and how. Again, this is anthropology, so a different perspective. Uh, the, the symbolism of the snake has come up in every culture is what he writes about. Mm. Uh, ayahuasca is a very snaky kind of medicine. I don't know if you know that. Everybody sees snakes, right? Snake, 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 snake. Yeah. And he, he writes about uh, Cosmic Serpent is the name of the book. He writes about the imagery of this dual helix that has existed for millennia across many different societies. It's almost Jungian in the sense that you keep seeing the symbol of this double helix, which is pretty interesting since that's what we're all based on when it comes down to the DNA yeah. code. Again, this highly coincidental. I'm not going to, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to die on that hill for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it, it it's interesting. And the reason why it is interesting is because plant medicine, I think, is opening up the door to sentience. It absolutely, that's that's the mysticism behind it is yeah. when people come away from it, they have this um, knowingness uh, about interconnection, sentience, um, and and the beingness that exists on earth, which transcends in many ways um, this base reality that, that we have. So yeah. that's. And there seems to be some sort of, that. <laughs> some sort of deep, deep connection there, but it, it's weird because I'm, I probably do this too much because I'm sort of over generously trying to look for overlaps and common ground where maybe there doesn't uh, exist any. But but I think in a way, even my boring sort of completely materialistic stance that I'm going to hold on to until I try or ask her anyway, um, almost gets you to a similar place because from a completely materialistic perspective, I don't think there's anything magical or distinctive or different going on from what's going on in my mind compared to what's going on in this pen in front of me. You know, ultimately we're all quarks and there's quantum wave functions or whatever it is, right? We are all one, we are all connected. And in a sense, that starts to sound like quite a mystical transcendent perspective where we are all one, we are all connected, we're made of the same stuff. Um, so I think you can, again, as you hinted out earlier on, there can be different paths maybe to Exactly. Coming and and really, it's this notion of being about able to, you know, we've we've talked about this lens, the scientific objective lens. And if you if you reframe that, you know, to use the analogy of Alice in Wonderland, it's literally stepping through that looking glass. That's the difference. Yeah, I think is it's not so much looking at it's really crossing over and, and being in, in, you know, the other side. I, I shared a tweet the other day um, that that was sort of related to this. Um, and it said, uh, okay, so you know, those, there's those bath, there, there's those chocolate bombs that you put, put inside of like a thing of hot chocolate, like it's like a polar bear or whatever. And so 
it's a, a dark chocolate bear sitting in a white cup of milk in the first frame. And, you know, the title is Tripping in Nature, which could mean multiple things. But, you know, you've got the bear and it says me and then it says nature. And then you start seeing the bear dissolve. And then, you you know, basically, you know, long the short of it is that the bear by the end is says, oh, I am nature. Because now the bear and the milk are as one. <laughs> They're brown together. They're like a light brown coffee color. They've all melted into each other. And of course, you have the awareness that you are one with nature. But it does not at all require that you need to do ayahuasca to achieve that state. Um, you know, I've got a book here on my shelf, which is a which is about uh, a naturalist who spent time with one square foot of forest. Do you know that book? No. I can pull that out really quickly. But basically, um, all he did for a year is he sat with one square foot of forest and just looked at the comings and goings, the, the ecosystem, the city, the life that took place in this one small area, what changed with the seasons. And, and it's marvelous. And I think you can reach awe and wonder and enchantment and connection and union in many different ways. Yeah, yeah. So it, I you can't do it. Agree. I don't think it's about being a boring naturalist. I think some of the naturalists, the best naturalists I, I've ever known are the people who are open to that level of connection, you know, yeah. as, as opposed to um, seeing it as separate. I think yeah. once you start to see things as separate from yourself, um, that's the illusion, as they would say, in uh, in some of the greater religions, but it's also an illusion from a scientific perspective as well. Yeah, completely agree. And I think my only appeal um, about this sort of sense of we are all one and everything is connected is that some people will take that in a way that almost flattens things ethically. It's almost like everything matters, so really nothing does. And I just want to call out an appeal for a, still a special place for entities that we think have the capacity to suffer. You know, I still think we could care about everything, but there's something distinct about beings that can value their own existence that still needs to get some degree of priority. But and yeah, yeah, I, I, I just think you know, I, I, whether or not trees can suffer, I still wouldn't want to see the trees mowed down either. Yeah. Yeah. So, you Agreed. know, and, and people have sometimes said that that's the first thing people will say, well, the vegetables have feelings too. <laughs> yeah. But as you know, from science, you know, we've been tamed by the plants, you know, we are their great procreators, they've used us in order to create fields and replicate themselves in many, many ways. So, yeah. uh, but I, I think that all life, all life, I think, uh, I, I don't even think I would divide it necessarily at what our, our traditional notions of suffering are. Yeah. When when I would make that divide the Christmas tree. Oh. <laughs> Makes sense. That's proper compassion. So I we don't have long left. I'm taking liberties with your time. And so this is really unfair to ask you as the final question. But how do we fix it all? How do we make a better future? And <laughs> you talked about activism as a gift and you talked about win, 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 wins. And, and I guess that's to frame it. It strikes me that many of the challenges we're facing now, whether it's environmental, climate, animal agriculture, they're not technically that difficult to solve. In many cases, we actually have the technical answer available. The real problem is human psychology and social norms. So, uh, and that's part of the frustration because even when you have a win-win-win-win, people still often won't want to engage with it. So what, what is your sense about how can we shift humanity's role to play a much more positive role with the planet and rest of sentient kind and how optimistic or pessimistic do you feel about our chances i i always think that the solution is never one there's no panacea so there's no sort of pill that you can pop so again whether that's a scientific approach whether that's a technological approach whether that's a religious approach whether that's a familial approach whether it's an indigenous approach all of them will have value but because we were talking about technology earlier and because i have a bit of that background as well um, I'll share one thing that I saw just the other day that I think, um, I hope I live to see. There was just an article yesterday, I believe, and it was about how scientific researchers are now using AI in order to start to look for pattern recognition and decode the language of whales. And as we started this discussion, I mentioned to you the work that Joe does, the work that We Animals does, is that they're giving a voice to the voiceless. But imagine what will happen, how our minds will be absolutely transformed when we live in the Dr. Doolittle world of being able to understand what animals say, understanding the beauty of the language, the calls, the songs, the birds, of, 
you know, all the other creatures that that live alongside us, you know, that we've been so deaf to all this for such a long period of time. And because we are such cerebral beings, I think that uh, we'll certainly have a lot to answer for when we start listening to what these other creatures have to say. Because if we um, even grant them the slightest, smallest amount of intelligence, uh, I think we're going to be blown away. And so if there is one good use for artificial intelligence that I can see, it's pattern recognition, it's ability to decode, uh, is the ability to start to decode animal language. And I think that once animals can speak for themselves, I mean, we've, we've, we've known for some time, of course, with uh, American Sign Language that there are chimps, there are, uh, you know, apes, but that's been highly debated, right? There are reasons yeah. why we have still really questioned whether or not uh, they are speaking to us or whether they're misusing those cues. But I think if we can start to decode what animals are saying, that's going to bring us into a whole different worldview because we have to think of the fact that for such a long period of time, and I was thinking about this um, with our family dog, uh, Bowie, who understands us. She understands English. You know what I mean? She understands food, you know, food, come, sit, da, 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 all these different things. You see all these videos on, on, you know, whether it's on Twitter or on TikTok or what have you, where a whole bunch of people will sit down and talk in dog language. Grandma, grandpa, code, you know what I mean? Or sorry, like bone, treat, whatever, whatever they're saying, right? And the dog's ears are just going bananas because they recognize all yeah. those English words. So you have all these animals. You have dolphins that understand our hand signals. You have, you know, chimps that are able to use iPads. They have been listening to us, dealing with us and listening to us for a long time. They understand human language commands to a certain degree. And yet we know nothing. We know that a dog wags its tail. We know that maybe a cat will, you know, purr. We are so completely, completely ignorant and very deliberately deaf to what other animals and species are saying. I think the minute we give them the microphone because they they do have their own enriched languages, they've been communicating with each other for you know, a long, long period of time yeah. for many different species, much longer than we've even been in existence as as Homo sapiens. What a tremendous uh, opening to the world that will present to us. So I'm I'm very much looking forward to that. That sounds good. That could finally break break us through from thinking of them as objects of fascination and wonder to appreciating them as individuals. So yeah, there's a hopeful Absolutely. message there. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'm going to let you go. What's the best way of people following you, learning more about your work, buying the reality bubble, of course? What's oh, the best ways of you. staying in touch and, and following your Earthlings uh, uh, thank you. animal parade um, too? Well, because, of course, you know, Twitter's gone through a little bit of a, a well, it, it's being dismantled yeah. by Elon Musk in, <laughs> in multiple ways. I am on Twitter at Zaya Tong. I've moved over to Mastodon. So um, I'm on the instance called Jurna, J O U R N A dot host slash at Zaya. So I'm at Zaya there. I've also joined Post News where I'm at Zaya. And um, I'm just working on a new documentary film right now on microplastics. So for the next few months, I'm going to be traveling the world and looking at microplastics and human health, microplastics in the human body, and of course, in the environment around us and how it comes into our systems and how it's impacting our health. Um, so that's what I'm going to be up to for the next little while. And uh, yeah, I just want to say a big thank you for a, a really wonderful, uh, inspiring and wondrous conversation. It was, it was terrific to meet you. Yeah, it's been wonderful to have you as a guest on Sentientist Conversations. Thank you. There are so many brilliant uh, science journalists, but it's really powerful to find one who's also twinned that with a rich sentiocentric compassion too. So yeah, I'm a big admirer. Thank you so much. Thank you.